songs. And uh, I have to tell you that, you know, within, within these uh, four or five books, I can't really remember when we started with Job, we went into um, to the Psalms, Proverbs, and then we got into, uh, after that, Ecclesiastes, and now the Song of Solomon. And so King Solomon, you know, most scholars attribute the book of Song of Solomon. It's also known as the Song of Songs. And so it didn't originally have the title Song of Solomon behind it. But, um, but nevertheless, most scholars do agree that this is uh, Solomon, which is King David's son that wrote this song. And it was known as the Song of Songs because it was a song that was considered above all songs, okay? Now, there's no question that when you read the Song of Solomon, within the, there's, a, there's a lot of sexual imagery that takes place in this book. I mean, there's just no question about it. Anybody that's read it, and, and, it, and it's, now it is, it is shrouded, if you will, in imagery and in illustration. Uh, but if you just take your time and you read it, if you got, you know what I'm saying, if you can catch on to any level of what's being said, you, you get on, catch on real quick that there's a lot of sexual imagery that's taking place. Now, at the same time, it's only fair to be honest that what's taking place through a literal interpretation of this book <clears throat> is that there's a young lady and this king, King Solomon, that are about to be wed. And so the story starts off in a form of a courtship that's taking place. And then there's actually a period of time in within the book where the young lady goes through a dream. She has a dream, you know, in the midst of that. And then at some point in time, they get married and they consummate their marriage. We're going to look through some various passages because we're preaching the whole book. We're not going into a detailed analysis of the literal interpretation of the particular book, but we're definitely going to read some passages and that alone is going to be at least very sensual or romantic at, at, at the very least. We probably won't get into all of the detailed things towards the end and it's not that I'm trying to stay away from it. To be honest with you, what I'm really desiring to do is to look more at the spiritual application of the book. Now, we have to also be careful whenever we do something with certain books of the Bible or Old Testament passages called allegorization, meaning we begin to think that the whole story is isn't a, isn't a literal story about Solomon and this woman known as the Shulamite woman. And so this is now Solomon had thousands of wives. We know that, right? He had thousands of wives. He had concubines. But what stands out about this Shulamite woman is that she is the apple of his eye. She was the bride that he wrote a song about. Okay. And, um, so we don't want to take away from that literal concept that Solomon had a wife that was a Shulamite woman and that he wrote this song about her, okay? At the same time, we understand that the Bible, not God is very serious about marriage. We know that because we see in the garden that he made them man and wife, and we understand that society is built upon that concept. At the same time, the Bible is written to the people of God and it's a spiritual book that has to do with his plan of redemption and the the, the sooner, as soon as I found that out, or as soon as I got a revelation of that, of the big picture of God, understanding that the Word of God is, you know, I've been explaining this for quite some time over the last couple of weeks, and many of you will remember when I've said these types of concepts, that the love of God is foreign to our mind. I know I've said that on multiple occasions over the last couple of sermons that I preach, and I've, I've quote, uh, quoted or referred to that passage out of Peter's epistle where he talked about what manner of love is this that you've bestowed upon us and the word manner literally describes something from a tri another tribe so it's a foreign tribe if you will but the really the idea that's what it meant in the Greek but the idea is is that it's foreign so the love of God is foreign and in reality if we think about it it comes from a foreign realm in other words God's love is pure and God's love our minds are tainted Did Y'all understand that? Can I get a what? what? Maybe yeah. I don't mean to be too silly here, but can I get a high five? Or can I get a head nod that we say yes? Yeah, preacher, I'm with you. I, my, my mind doesn't always think the way that it's supposed to think. My heart, I don't know that. My, I want people to think when you look at me on the outside that I'm all okay, but the reality of it is, 
I still got some things in my life and in my heart that I know are not lined up with the Word of God. Amen. I'm a work in progress. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I, so I told y'all a while back, somebody in the church shared with me that somebody was giving them a hard time, telling them they were a hypocrite and all that, and they busted out that song, God's still working on me. He's going to make me what it ought to be. It took him just a day to make the moon and the stars, Jupiter and Mars, but he's still working on me. And I guess what? I did it at work. Somebody started giving me a hard time. I pulled it out right there in front of three of them nurses. God's still working on me. Amen. And so we understand that, right? But at the same time, so, so God's love is for him. It comes from another realm. It's hard for us to perceive it. And when I use this, I'm not just trying to use church lingo, man. I believe in us learning these words. We have a carnal mindset. You know what the word carnal comes from the word carne. You ever been to Tampico's carne asada? It means meat, flesh. Carnal mindset has to do with the flesh, the physical aspect of man. But the physical aspect of man is his flesh is driving him. He's thinking about the here and now. What's going to make me feel good, right? That, I mean, you could, and listen, we can start listing all kinds of stuff. We can start listing all kinds of addictions. We can start listing all kinds of sin. And we don't need to get into all that right now because you know what I'm talking about, right? It's anything that makes your flesh feel good. And so our carnal mind prevents us from really being able to understand the, the purity of God's love, right? And, and the more we begin to understand spiritually the love of God, the easier it is for us to make that connection and to begin to see. And so I have to tell you that with... Even though there's going to be a lot of sexual imagery, the connections that we're trying to make, or a lot of romantic imagery, I keep saying the word sexual, um, the, the, the connections that we're trying to make is the fact that God desires to have an intimate relationship with his people. As a matter of fact, the, the Song of Solomon, I thought this was an interesting thing that I learned as I was studying to, to, to preach this. The Song of Solomon was read after the time frame of this book being written on the eighth day of the Passover. Now, do y'all remember the, what the Passover was? Y'all remember that story in the Bible? I mean, I talk about it all the time, so y'all ought, ought to be able to remember with me what I'm talking about. But, you know, the Passover took place probably about what? I mean, we, we say, I usually say somewhere about around 1450 B.C. Okay, that's whenever, that was the Exodus, right? Do you remember the Passover night? Y'all remember the story? If, for those of you who maybe don't, let me just remind you that, that the, the children of Israel had become Egyptian slaves. And that God sent a message. He, he, he met Moses at the burning bush. And he told him that he was going to use Moses to deliver his children out of Egyptian bondage. He, told, he said, you go tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that they can worship me. Amen. Now, we've already talked about the spiritual type of that. How Egypt is a type of the world. How Satan, I'm sorry, Pharaoh is a type of Satan. And that God wants to deliver his children out of the bondage of the world and under Pharaoh's <coughs> grip and deliver them them through the Red Sea, descriptive of salvation, hallelujah, and move us into the promised land, which is the place of victory. But for that to happen, what had to happen that night was what we call the Passover. And, and, and we call it, and the, the lamb that took place that night was called the Paschal or the Passover lamb. And what happened is, is that they had to find a lamb that was out without spot or blemish. They had to cut its throat, collect its blood. And what did they have to do with it? Take that blood and apply it to the doorposts and the side posts, right? He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over. Same thing, when you apply the blood of Jesus, the, the, the eternal Lamb of God to your heart, whenever judgment comes upon this fallen world on Egypt out there, because it's coming, it, the day is going to come. Y'all know it. Y'all ain't crazy. Y'all been watching the news too a little bit. Y'all know that this world's getting crazy. I don't know how much time we got. I'm not here to predict anything, but it's coming. Judgment is going to come upon yeah. this earth. But praise God, Jesus took the judgment for sin upon the believer. Oh, but I still got problems. Well, welcome to the club, Christian. You know, we're all in the process. Amen. Uh, but, but this is the thing. Jesus paid the price for your sin. And you need to understand that. You need to start to believe that. And it will start to liberate you and give you victory in those areas. Instead of you just walking around under a cloud of condemnation and guilt. Like, I can't just get out of that. I can't, I can't get past all that I've done. No, Jesus paid the price for your sin. Amen. Trust that. Believe Amen. that. Hallelujah. Let him take the burden off your back. Yeah. Stand up straight. Pick your head up. And set your eyes forward. Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus and what he did for you at the cross. Then watch the Holy Spirit begin to do the work in your life. He'll clean you up on the inside. Amen. Amen. Grace is an inside job. All right. 
I've gone off. But Passover <laughs> is where the Lord delivered them. So about 1450 BC is Passover. Somewhere around 1050, a lot of stuff's happening, right? I mean, we got the wilderness journey, 40 years. We got the judges, 400 years. We got the kings, right? About 1050 BC is King David, somewhere around there. And so Solomon, Solomon is somewhere after that. And so exactly when the, I didn't really look at the date when the Song of Solomon was written, you know, I can't tell you exactly because I didn't really go back and look. But what I'm trying to make, the point I'm trying to make is the Passover was here. Solomon was somewhere around here. So you're looking at right there about what? What is that? 400 years? Something like that? 400 years later, and from that time moving forward when they would have their Passover celebration. Because you remember we studied Passover enough to tell to, for us to be reminded of the fact that God told Moses, tell my children to keep this observance every year. It's a memorial unto them to remind them that I delivered them out of this bondage with a strong and a mighty hand. That's why when we take communion, Jesus said, whenever he came to the table of the last supper to take communion, he said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And what he wants us to remember is that I'm telling you, because see, Jesus was crucified on Passover. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 called him the pa Christ our Passover has been crucified for us. You get that? I mean, do you think that was an accident? 1450 B.C., 33, and possibly a half A.D., Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, is crucified on the exact night of the Passover all these thousands of years later that you think that was an accident? No, God wrote it into the script that Amen. way. But man is too blind to see the power of God. And so the point is this, is that God had a Passover lamb. He had a plan the whole time that Jesus would fulfill that type and that shadow. Amen. And so from that time moving forward, though, after the song of Solomon was written, they would read it on the eighth day of the Passover feast. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is why in the world would they read this book on the eighth day of the Passover feast? And I don't know that I can definitively answer that question for you, but I will tell you this, that within the imagery of this book is repeated the concepts of harvest, the concepts of a marriage, the concepts of intimacy. And one of the things that we do know that Israel saw themselves as the bride of Jehovah. Uh, in other words, they saw themselves as the bride of Jehovah, the people of God, the special, peculiar people of God. And, you know, I've said this many times, too, whenever I preach the Old Testament, I try to make sure that y'all understand that this is how I see it. This is the best way I can explain it to you, okay, is that Old Testament Israel collectively as a group of people, as they're navigating the globe, you know, they're walking around as a people group, a nation. They're the people of God. And, and, and they're like big brother to Christian. So Christian's the people of God too. His name's Christian. Big brother's name's Israel. And big brother made some mistakes that we were supposed to learn from. But it's eerily reminiscent when you watch big brother Israel's life, his failures, his journeys, his repentance. It looks so much like young brother Christian's life. Same story, valleys and mountaintops and failures and repentance and, and same God, same people, two different time frames, two different covenants, but all the same plan. In the Old Testament, God's moving people, moving, preparing humanity through the nation of Israel to give birth to Messiah. In the New Testament, and even today, God's moving humanity back to Messiah, to the cross, so that we can die to the old man born of Adam, so that we can be married to the Lord, hallelujah, an altar. Think about it. I mean, when you get married, you come to an altar. Whenever the sacrifice was offered, it was offered at an altar, and, and, and the two become one. And so what we see in the imagery of that is also when we come to Christ through the cross, the old man born of Adam dying, now we're, we're marrying ourselves to another, even the Lord Jesus Christ, according to what Romans chapter 7 
verse 5 says, so that we might die to the law, so that we might be married to another, even Jesus Christ, hallelujah, who died and rose from the dead. And so now we've come together in union with Jesus. We are the people of God, amen? And so then Israel saw themselves as the people of God. And so that's why they would read the Song of Solomon on the eighth day of Passover, remembering the, the God that we serve delivered us and he made us his own special people. Amen. And, and so I wanted I wanted you to, to see some of that right there. And you know, one scripture, I mean, I could really preach a whole sermon on this about Israel being the bride of Christ. But one particular passage of scripture, Jeremiah <laughs> chapter 31. Verse 32. And she, yeah, she's, I knew she'd get it. All right, let's look at that. Now, let me just tell you what this is talking about overall is the new covenant. The, God is talking through the, through the prophet Jeremiah, telling them that he's going to create a new covenant. It says, not according to the covenant that I made with your, their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. So what, what the imagery is here is that God's saying, listen, I had a covenant with, your father, with the fathers of the old times. But the, the covenant that I'm talking about is a new covenant. And what he's talking about is in Christ, in Jesus. And he said, in that new covenant, the law is not going to be written on stones. No, it's going to be written on men's hearts. Yeah. And he said, it's going to be, but, but he said, it's going to, not going to be the covenant like the one that they broke with me. They broke it, even though I was a husband to them. And so I just wanted you to see that picture. So within the Song of Solomon, I'm just trying to make the point that we see the imagery of a man and his future wife taking place, but that we have to understand that God's word is a word about redemption. God's word is a word about salvation. God's word is a word about a marriage. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus came preaching the kingdom parables. That's why he preached on the marriage feast. Amen. There was a king who, who made a marriage feast for his son and he invited all of the people to come. Did somebody ever invite you? He told people, go out and go out there and invite them to come. Amen? Amen. And, and he was talking about Israel. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. They'd go and fight. And what would happen is, oh, no, I got stuff to do. I got to plow my field. I got to go to work. I got this. I got that. It's just too busy, man. Life's busy. I can't go to your son's marriage. And, then, and so the, the king was distraught. He said, all right, well, then you just go out and you gather them all up. See, now he's talking about the Gentiles. My own people called by my name that I created out of Abraham. They don't want to come to me that I delivered out with a mighty hand out of the Egyptian bondage. They don't want to come to me. Okay, you go out into all the streets and you just gather them up. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they sound like. Anybody that wants to marry my son, bring them into the marriage so that they might partake. Hallelujah. Of the marriage, supper of the land, the feast. Amen. And so that's the imagery that we have. So. I wanted you to know that God wants to have an intimate relationship with his people. Now, once again, watch your carnal brain, watch your carnal mind. We know that when God, when we're talking intimacy with God, we ain't talking nothing sexual, right? That would be just too weird. All right. But what we are trying to say is, is this, is that there is an intimate level of knowing God. Amen. And, 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 and you know, likely... One of the ways to try to describe that is to try to approach mankind from some from an understanding that they may have. Right. And, you know, I have to be honest with you. You know, I'm certainly not the world's authority on this situation right here. But if you read the imagery in this book from a literal perspective, what, what you're going to see here, I'm just telling you, is you're going to see two people that are madly in love with one another. I'm talking about human love in a way like I don't know how I'm just saying I mean I I don't know how many people experience the type of love that's being described in this book from a human perspective I mean they're head over heels in love with one another and um, but that's definitely how God wants to have a relationship with us he definitely wants to have 
and, and it, you know, it's kind of like they're they're longing for one another's presence. You understand what I'm getting at? Um, whenever whenever they're separated from one another, they're not comfortable with it at all, and they long to be with one another. And certainly, that is the desire that God has. At least as in a relationship with you and I. Now, I did want to I did want to share a couple of passages in the New Testament before I get started. I don't think it's going to take us long to go through the passages in Song of Solomon, but I wanted to make a point in the New Testament, like in Matthew chapter one, verse twenty-five, that there's a word in the Greek language that literally describes what I'm trying to tell you about. And and what I mean is is that this word in, in Matthew one twenty-five, we're going to just flip through a couple of different scriptures. It says, And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. What do y'all think that's talking about right there? If you don't go up and read. That's talking about Joseph. Joseph knew her not, talking about Mary, until she brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. I wanted you to see that word knew right there. Because that word new in the Greek language is actually this word right here in the Greek. It's, it's gnosko. Now, I'm not trying to teach you a bunch of Greek words. I'm just trying to make you understand something. This word has the idea of being very familiar with the situation. As a matter of fact, this word in the Greek is also used to describe sexual intimacy. I mean, and that's what it's talking about in that passage of Scripture. You see that? It says that he knew her not. What that's talking about is, is that Mary was a virgin when she gave back birth to Jesus. And that the two of them never consummated their marriage sexually until Jesus was born. And so, you know, any Catholic person that tells you that Mary stayed the eternal virgin, it's not true. She had other children afterwards. And we're not going to get into all that. Okay. But, but, you know, one day we will maybe, but not tonight. All right. Here's another passage of scripture. Luke chapter one, verse 34. And it shows you basically the same kind of thing that I'm, that I'm trying to explain to you right here. I mean, basically this is the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and he said, he says to her what's going to happen. And this is her response. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be? So saying, I know not a man. I've never been sexually intimate with a man. How in the world am I going to give birth to a, to a man child? How is that going to happen? Okay. Uh, but now look at this. The, the word doesn't always mean that. If we look at chapter uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 11, we see it used in another context. In Mark chapter 4, verse 11, it says, And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Now, what he's talking about right there is, is this, the same word, gnosko. And what he's talking about is, is that the people on the outer fringes, when I come up here and I teach on the mountaintop and I teach them in parables, a, a sower went out to sow. And some of the seed fell along the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured the seed. And some fell along among stone, and he goes through the whole story. But then he pulls his disciples away. And I'm like, why are you talking to him in parables, Lord? Because unto you it is permitted for you to know, gnosko, for you to be intimately familiar with and intimately involved with the teachings, and for you to have an understanding and to know something in a very deep way in a very intimate way in a very how you you can't know another person like you know a person that you've had a relationship with like that you understand what i'm saying so it's a familiarity of knowing something and to have a depth of knowledge about about the situation and so that's why it can be used in a couple of different ways here's here's a here's a passage of scripture chapter uh john chapter 10 verse uh, 14 It says, I am the good shepherd. <coughs> John, John 10, 14. <coughs> I am the good shepherd, and I and know, gnosko, my sheep, and am known, gnosko, of mine. So what it's saying is, is that I'm the good shepherd. I have some sheep, and I know them. I know them intimately. I am very familiar with those who belong to me, and my sheep know me. They're familiar with me. They know me. I'm the good shepherd. Amen? All right, John chapter 5, 
verse 41. This is a little bit of a different context, and this is the last one, and then we'll go ahead and get into the Song of Solomon. It says in John 5, 41, really it's 42, but it says, I receive not honor from men. Now, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees right here. You know them, those religious leaders that were always giving him a hard time and always trying to come against him and fight against him and catch him in traps, right? But I know you, he's saying, I know you, you Pharisees, that ye have not the love of God in you. <laughs> and, you know, Jesus, what, you might have a whole lot of churches nowadays that are quote unquote seeker sensitive. Jesus wasn't like that. He didn't preach no seeker sensitive message. He straight up told religion to their face. He said, I, he, what did he say? I know you. I know you. I gnosko you. I'm real familiar with the inside of your heart. And I know what's going on inside of you that you have not the love of God in you. And so essentially all I was trying to say is, is that there's no way to connect that particular word back to the Old Testament because the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, the New Testament is written in Greek. I'm just trying to give you an understanding that there are some passages of Scripture that contain a Greek word in them that describe intimacy and deep familiarity. And so from that we take this passage of Scripture out of the Song of Solomon and understanding it from a spiritual perspective that God desires to have a relationship with his people as a man has with his bride. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? All right. <laughs> Let's go ahead and start reading in Song of Solomon chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> and these first four verses, literally, that's what it's talking about. That's what I see here is intimacy, okay? It says, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For thy love is better than wine. Now, one of the things that we have to understand to go ahead and stop. Well, let's just go ahead and read all four verses and then we'll come back. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For thy love is better than wine. <clears throat> because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love thee. Draw me. Now, you know, a virgin also could mean a young woman during that time frame. That word in the King James language when it's translated into English can mean both of those. A young woman, uh, you know, of any age, but then all, also specifically a young woman who's never known a man, okay? <clears throat> and so once again, it's not a, that right there is not necessarily a, a sexual connotation. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. Now, wine was mentioned twice in those four verses. And, you know, there's a lot of different things that we can say about wine. Spiritually, wine has to do with the Holy Spirit. But it's obvious sometimes the whole, it'll connect to the Holy Spirit or it can even connect to the crucifixion, you know, in the New Testament. But obviously, wine isn't being used in that type of context right here. Wine isn't being used, wine is being used inferiorly to the type of love that this woman is talking about. And let me just say this, I didn't tell you, but the majority of the voice, you know, whenever you write, write a book, there's a voice. There's a main, usually a main character that's speaking. Who's speaking for the story? The majority of the voice in this story is this Shulamite woman. She's the one that's talking. So Solomon, when the Holy Spirit told him to write it, wrote it as though he was writing it through her eyes, if that makes sense. And, um, but there are times whenever Solomon himself speaks and the main characters of the story are the Shulamite woman, Solomon, and then she seems to have some brothers that are mentioned later in the book, and then there's one young sister that she has um, that's also mentioned in the latter part of the book, and then other than, and then there's also these young maidens who are known as the daughters of is, of, of Israel, and so those are the main characters of the book, and it kind of goes back and forth with some dialogue like that, and it's kind of important that we. That I made that point, you know, so that as we get into some of these scriptures, but she mentions wine twice is the point I wanted to make. Now, one of the things that I do know about wine is that when you drink it now, let's let's be fair with one another. I'm, I mean, I'm just telling you, you remember, I talked I started off talking about flesh, didn't I? And what did I say about flesh that that it feels good for a period of time? Right. And anybody that's ever drank. If there is a right amount of wine, I don't, I mean, I don't drink it anymore for sure because I don't play that game and tried to find the right amount and it don't ever stay the right amount with me. I mean, maybe you figured it out, but it doesn't work that way with me. 
Um, but if there's a certain amount of wine that you can't lie and say that whenever it gets into your bloodstream that it doesn't start to change chemical things in your brain and make you feel good. Mm -hmm. But what the point about wine is that it's temporary. You see, it may, makes you feel good, but it doesn't last. And we also know the reality of it is, is that in today's society, or most of us have experienced wine in a whole different way, where we don't even really want to talk good about it and lift it up because it's really brought a lot of destruction to a lot of people's lives, yes. if we're honest with one another, right? Yes. And so, but at the same time, and the, you know, wine wasn't looked at exactly the same back then. There were people that were drunkards back then, but, but you know, wine was a staple in their diet because of the fact that they had vineyards of grapes and really and truly their wine wasn't as fermented as what it is today. Plus they would cut it like three parts with water and their purpose wasn't like people in South Louisiana, man, like pass the mad dog dude and turn it up and start chugging the stuff. That's not what they were doing. You know, they would, they would drink a glass of wine that was watered down and diluted with their meal and, you know, maybe, t but they weren't over there getting a the buzz and getting drunk. You know, that wasn't, not, once again, I'm not saying that nobody wasn't getting drunk, but the proverb even talks about that, about the drunkard and he who lingers long at the wine and he said you know what he's going to do he's going to drink and he's going to drink and he's going to drink and he's going to be like somebody on top of a mast of a ship you can about imagine being on top of a mast of a ship laying in your bed rolling like this and it says he's going to wake up he's going to say let me do it all over again he didn't learn anything from the night before and that's kind of like what wine will do to you it'll destroy you in that sense but the yeah. main idea here is that his love is better than wine because that stuff is temporary, but listen to me, when we look at it from a spiritual perspective, then the love of our Lord Jesus Christ is not temporary, amen, it's an eternal love, and it's never going to leave us, it's never going to forsake us, it's always going to be there for us, it's something that we can cling to, it's something that we can hold to, when everything else is like shifting sand upon this earth, and that's what Jesus talked about in one of the parables, he said, a man that builds his house on the sand... Uh, it's not it's a foolishness thing but but he who builds his house on the rock amen and he is the rock that will not be moved amen, amen. all right and so that was the first part and you, you hear the language about the intimacy and how it sounds right there all right now look at verse five this is her continuing to talk she says i am black but comely O ye daughters of jerusalem as the tents of kedar as the curtains of solomon Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. Another interpretation could, for angry could be were harsh with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard have I not kept. So the idea here is that the way she sees herself, this is the Shulamite woman speaking. And the way she sees herself is that her skin is dark. Okay, and there's other passages or other terminology in here where she talks about the fairest of the women. And so talking about a lighter skin. So there's been times in history, you know, nowadays people try to go get a tan over there in Destin and try to make white skin dark. But there's been times in history where fair skin was looked upon with, you know what I'm saying, with great beauty. And, and what she's saying is, is that don't look upon me. She, she's ashamed of the way that she looks. And the reason that she's so black or dark skinned is because her mother's children, speaking of her brothers, because once again, the, the sister in the latter part of the story is she seems to be a young virgin and the, and the, and the, and the, the Shulamite woman is trying to encourage her, don't, don't go after love too soon, hold on to your virginity and things like that. So she's really young. So she's not the one that's making the Shulamite work in the sun. It's her brothers. Her brothers have been harsh upon her and have made her work in the vineyard and she's been in the vineyard and she's been working and, and the sun has been beating upon her and it's made her skin black is how she calls it blacker than some of these some of this the, this wool that they would get from these areas from these goats that produce black wool and so once again she's embarrassed of of the way that she looks but one of, the th one of the themes within the Song of Solomon, in addition to the fact that there's the theme of marriage and a marriage consummation and a feast and a bride and a bridegroom, and we talked about that throughout the entirety of the scriptures, there's also within this book the theme of a harvest, or at least the theme of working in a field. That's a common theme throughout the entirety of scripture. You know, you got the, 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 the good man went out, he sowed good seed 
in the, in the field. The son of man sowed good seed in the field. And whenever the men went to sleep, an enemy came and he sowed tares, poisonous, poisonous plants or that look like wheat, but, but they're not wheat. And instead, at the end, they turn black. They show themselves. And if you eat them, they'd be poisoned. And, then, and the concept behind that is that Jesus came sowing good seed. He came to sow the good word of God. But that the enemy comes, he brings in false doctrine. He brings in liars into the church that cause trouble. And, 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 when, and, and Jesus said, you can't pull them up together. You'll destroy, you'll destroy the good wheat too. You got to wait to the end of the harvest. And we're going to separate it all out. We're going to see what we really had in the end. And the Lord's going to separate it all out. Amen. Amen. And so, but what we see about this Shulamite woman is her skin is dark. She looks down on herself. But what she's doing is she's working. She's in the vineyard, you see, and she's working hard. Amen. And, and so, but look, Solomon doesn't see her that way. He, she sees herself a certain way, but look at verse nine. Now, I got to tell you that some of this imagery is going to be hard for you and I to relate to. Some of you might be thinking, I hope if the Lord sends me the right man that he don't tell me this. Or, you know, some of you guys might be thinking, man, I sure hope that she don't ever think that way of me. I mean, what kind of adjective is that to use, right? But, but the reality of it is, is that at that time, this was obviously a very, um, a very great compliment, Okay. So this is how Solomon sees her. She sees herself black. Don't look at me. He says, I have compared thee, O oh my love, to a company of horses and Pharaoh's chariots. Thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels and neck with chains of gold. And so, you know, the idea is, is that he sees her as though she's a horse, one of the horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Now, in order to understand that, we have to understand the time frame of what we're dealing with. That's why context matters so much. And the reality of it is, is that if you read behind certain scholars, what you learn is, is that it would be unheard of at this time frame to have a mare as one of Pharaoh's chariots. See, Pharaoh from Egypt had great horses. Solomon was a horseman. He had he had multiple horses. He had, you know, we talked about him last week in Ecclesiastes. He had orchards. He had all types of animals. He was into horses. And, and so, but, but Pharaoh would never have allowed a mare, a female horse to be pulling his chariot. But what Solomon says is, let me tell you something. You are so beautiful. You are so unique. That's where you belong. You belong right there in the midst of the best of whatever Pharaoh thought that he had. That's what, and what you and I need to understand is, is that how, that's exactly how the Lord sees you and I. Amen. The Lord is madly in love with us. And so much so that he's proven it. He gave his life to die on the cross for our sin. Amen. He can't prove it any more than he already did. Amen. I was listening to a preacher this morning. He said, he ain't coming back to do it again. He already came and died on the cross. Hallelujah. He's not coming back to die again. When he comes back, uh oh, he's coming for a bride. Amen. Hallelujah. And so now's the time to marry yourself to the Son of God. Amen. And so she, but look, but look, she now says this in chapter 2, verse 1. She says something a little bit different about herself. Let's go ahead and actually read a couple of these verses here. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Now, that was a little something for me to deal with right there because, you know, there's that old gospel song that says, talks about him being the rose of Sharon. This is actually the Shulamite woman we're talking about here. But, it, but I will tell you that Jesus is precious like the rose of Sharon. Amen. And, um, but anyway, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved. See, the beloved is Solomon that she's talking to. And so she calls herself now the rose of Sharon and the lily amongst the valleys. And, and well, actually, she says right here, uh, the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight. And his fruit was sweet to my taste. And so what she's saying is, is this. She's saying that um, now she sees herself a little bit different. She sees herself. See, she, first she saw herself as black. Don't look at me. But then Solomon turns around and he tells her something different. He says, no, that's not who you are. You're, you're beautiful. You, you belong in, to pulling Pharaoh's 
chariot. That's how beautiful you are. That's how special you are. That's how unique you are. And, and now she's starting to kind of believe a little different about herself. And, and what she's saying is, well, I'm the rose of Sharon. I, I'm a lily among thorns. Uh, I'm not a thorn. I'm a flower in the midst of thorns. And so, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that when we come to the Lord, if we'll allow him to do his work in us, even though we come in beat up, drug up, right? Bleeding. He let me bleed and die on the Jericho road, but he poured in the oil and the wine. Amen? Amen. And the Lord will come in and he'll pour in the oil and the wine. And when you start to let the word of God speak to you, what he's going to start speaking to you is the words of encouragement. Amen? Now, don't get me wrong. He's going to tell you about yourself, but his point is to bring healing and restoration into your life. Amen? Amen. And, to, and to allow the Holy Spirit to heal you. And whenever that happens and you start believing what the word of God says about you rather than what you believe about yourself, then you can start to see yourself in a different light. It will start to change you on the inside. Amen. And that's what's happening to her is that she's starting to see herself different. But then also what the way she sees him, he's an apple tree amongst the trees of the wood. So you can imagine, if you can imagine a, tr uh, a bunch of wood, uh, wooded area, and there's one apple tree in the midst of that. I mean, it stands out. It is so distinct. It is so different than everything else that is around them. Amen. That, and, but yet she finds a place to get shade under there. So he's providing protection. See, before she was getting beaten by the sun, she was her skin was being darkened by the sun, and now she's finding shade and protection from the Lord. Listen, there's multiple scriptures in the script in the Bible that talk about. About that they talk about the shade it's resting under the shade of God now in both of those concepts it's really he's he's descriptive more like a, a mother hen almost like in Matthew chapter uh, 23 it talks about in 37 it talks about the fact that uh, oh Jerusalem Jerusalem you who kill the prophets how long I would have gathered you under and put you under my wings like a mother hen puts her chicks under there right uh, in in Psalm chapter 91 verse 1 the scripture talks about the fact that he who dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty so God provides protection for us amen I'm be honest with you I believe with all the shadow of a doubt the secret place is having a revelation of being in Christ Amen. The place to be hidden in Christ. When your faith is in the finished work of Christ, now the Holy Spirit places you in him. And in that place, there's protection and there's victory and there's strength. Amen. Amen. All right. And so it seems and, and then she goes on to say right here uh, in verse four, he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. So. What's happening here is, is that Solomon isn't ashamed of her. Solomon brings her to the banquet and that what she recognizes is that he's loved. You know, there's a scripture out of the book of Hebrews that talks in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 says he's not ashamed to call his brethren. The Lord became us. Amen. The, the word of God teaches us that because the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he took, he took part of the same so that he could become us so that he could die in our place. He said he's not ashamed to call us brethren in the midst of the congregation. Amen. And so the Lord is not ashamed of you. Unfortunately, if we're honest, there's been times in each and every one of our lives where we've been ashamed of him. Come on, yeah. somebody, help me out here. You know I'm preaching the truth. Yeah. And you know, and you knew it when you did it. You knew it when you missed your opportunity and you didn't take up for the Lord because you, boy, look, your heart was so heavy when you walked away. Amen. Aren't you glad he forgives you? Aren't you glad that he gives you second chances? Because, Lord, I don't think there's a worse feeling in the world than to know that you just, can you imagine poor Peter? I mean, I, some of us preachers, man, we pick on Peter so much, but could you imagine the distress, the dis how distraught he must have felt after he denied the Lord three times? Oh, man, I don't even want to think about that right now. But anyway, y'all get the point. Well, so so the Lord's definitely not ashamed of, of us. Amen. And it says in verse eight, the voice of my beloved. So when the, it's kind of like a change of scenery. They had been at the banquet. But now it's obvious that she had been sent home, okay? And it says right here, with the, way that it's, the way that it's translated, it says, The voice of my beloved, this is verse 8 of chapter 2. The voice of my beloved, exclamation point. So it's almost like she's sitting there doing whatever it is that she's doing, and all of a sudden she snaps to attention and she says, It's the voice of my beloved. Wait, hold on. Shh. 
I, I hear him. I hear his voice. Amen. And don't we know that the Lord is constantly desiring to speak to us. Amen. And, and to get our attention and for us to, to hear him. And But she says, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. So she sees him at, in his agility. She sees him in strength. As a matter of fact, she starts talking. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Both of those are descriptive of male deers, like a stag or a buck. And so she's seeing him in agility. She's seeing him in strength and she sees him leaping upon the mountains. You know, whenever Jesus comes back the second time, his foot's going to land on Mount of Olives. Amen. It's going to split split that mountain right in half. Amen. The Lord is, is full of strength. Amen. And he's a great warrior. Hallelujah. It says right here, but look at what this says. So in verse 9, my beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he stands behind our wall he looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. It's almost like there's a level of hiddenness, a level of secrecy connected to it. He's like not showing himself completely at this point, you know? And then, but I want you to see what ends up happening before it's over. Look what my beloved spoke, verse 10, and said unto me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Now, there's coming a day whenever Jesus is coming back for his bride. Amen. Amen. And, and sometimes some of that is shrouded in a little bit of secrecy. Don't get me wrong now. What's happening is, is that we can behold, I hear his voice. And, and, and we're starting to be aware of the, of the signs of the times and the time frame that we're in. But at the same time, it's shrouded just enough. It's like he's behind the lattice. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen. Somebody's giving you a date. Let us read the book before we get too excited. Amen. Um, he, maybe they got it, but we need to read the book. But, but, this, but this is the point. Is that, you know what, some of it is shrouded in mystery. And we don't know exactly, but we can hear his voice. And he's trying to tell us. He's trying to tell us as the church, I'm coming back. Amen. I'm coming back and the time is short and that we're to be about our father's business. And so my beloved spoke and said unto me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For I like, the, I like these ad, this illustration of what's going on. Look, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. When you think about a rainy winter, what do you think about? I think dreariness, right? It's been rough. Look, that, that's over with. Come on, get up. It's springtime. It's harvest time. Look what it says. It says the flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come and the voice of the turtle is heard in the in our land. The fig tree puts forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. And so what I see in this imagery is the fact that, yes, the cold, rainy, dreary season has passed. Come on. This time frame on the earth that has taken place under the dominion of the evil one, at least as far as sin has ruled and reigned in the hearts of men, has been dreary and cold and separate from God. But there's coming a change in season. Amen. The flower put the flower blooms. The fig puts forth their fruit. You see even the imagery of harvest here. And once again, what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that God is all about a big harvest. Amen. He's about to take a harvest of humanity. Humanity from this earth. Amen. And that's what it's all been about. The sowing of seed, producing a crop, and he's going to one day harvest that crop. And that crop is you and I, believers, Old Testament Israel, New Testament church, hallelujah, one in Christ, and we're going to meet him in the air. Amen. 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 All right. So let's see here. In chapter three, now in chapter three, it's as though she's dreaming. And what it says in chapter 3, verse 1 is, By night on my bed I sought him, my, I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. So she's looking for him, but she can't find him. I will rise now and go about the city and the streets, and in the broadways I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I found him not. Have you ever sought the Lord? Have you ever been looking for the Lord and you've been separated from him and you feel as though you can't hear his voice and you can't find him? This is when she's been in the midst of a dream. She's waking up. She's, she's, she's desperate to be reconnected to, to him and she's looking for him. And then it says in verse 3, the watchmen that go about the city found me to whom I said, saw ye him whom my soul loveth? 
It was but a little while, it was but a little that I passed from them, but I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house, into the chamber of her that conceived me. So once again, the idea here seems to be that she's having a dream. She, in the midst of her dream, she can't find the one that her, lo her soul loves. She's walking around frantically looking for him she comes across the watchmen of the city now in that time frame in israel there were watchmen that sat upon the wall it's multiple references to the watchmen their purpose was to make sure that danger wasn't intruding upon the city as a matter of fact god told ezekiel in in, in his passages in this, in this in one ezekiel chapter 3 verse 17 he said son of man i've made you a watchman for my people and he told him, he said, your job is to tell people about the sin that they're in. If you, if you do not warn my people that there's a problem and they die in the midst of their sin, their blood is going to be on your hands. But if you warn them about their sin and they refuse not to turn to the right way, then their blood will be on their own hands. And so a watchman was one who watched out. And so a good watchman is kind of like, at least in that passage of scripture, like a preacher. And a preacher's job is definitely to warn the people, to warn the people and to let them know, hey, danger lurks ahead. Amen. And what I mean by that is that the world is against Jesus. Jesus told his disciples, if they hate you, they first hated me. And the, and the warning to all those out there in the world is, you need to get in the boat. You need to climb up into Noah's Ark, which, which represented the coming in through the cross and, and becoming the child of God through, for the safety to prevent you from being swallowed up in the midst of the judgment and the storm that is coming. Make sure you connect yourself to God. Amen? Amen. And so that's so she, you know, she ends up finding him and she says she wasn't about to let him go now in chapter five they're married now and so you know she if you'll remember earlier she was she was listening for his voice she said oh the voice of my beloved and then now in this dream she can't find him but she's searching frantically for him and then now in chapter five in verse two it says i sleep but my heart waketh so she's asleep on the bed and her heart wakes up. It is the voice of my beloved that knocks, saying, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with uh, my undefiled. Uh, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. So he's wanting to come into her. So they're married now. He's wanting to come into her. I have this, but this is her response. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I make them dirty? So that quickly, she doesn't seem to be really as responsive to his call. Like he's coming to the door. He's wanting to come in. He's wanting to be in her presence. But she said, well, I kind of took a bath already. I cleaned my feet. I took my, my, my house coat off. I'm in the bed. I mean, you want me to get up and walk on the, on the dirty floor? Is that what you really want me to do? And it says, but, but she ends up getting up. It says uh, in verse four, my beloved put, put in his hand by the hole of the door and my bowels were moved for him. So he kind of put his hand there and bowels meaning her insides. Her insides jumped a little bit. She, her, her tummy got some little flutters in it. And so all of a sudden it says, I rose up to open the, to my beloved and my hands dropped with myrrh. Now myrrh is a, is a form of a, of a gummy incense. It was used for multiple purposes. In this way, it's definitely talking about rope. It's definitely has a romantic connotation to it. But myrrh was also one of the incense is used for the embalming of Jesus's body. And so that's one of the things that, that I always, uh, you know, think about when I hear the word myrrh, but anyway, my fingers with sweet smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my love, but my beloved had withdrawn himself. So she waited a little too long. So, you know, as I don't want to get my feet dirty, but then it's like now all of a sudden I hear his voice. I see his hand. My tummy's fluttering. I want to get up there. I want to go open the door to my beloved. But when I open the door, he's gone. And so I opened, but he was gone. He had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. 
look at this, how different this is. Verse 7, the watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. So now, before it sounded like they were kind of helping her. Now they're striking her. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. It's almost like it's her fault that all this has happened. And before we get into verse 8, I just want to, I just want to you know, kind of describe the, the spiritual connotation. I mean, it's like, you know, how true it is, if we think about it, how when we first come to the Lord, how many times we're so excited, we're listening. It's the voice of my beloved. It's the, it's the voice of the Lord. You know what I'm saying? And we want to get to know Him. We get into the Word. We spend time in His presence. And then before you know it, it's kind of like, oh, I kind of took a bath. I don't want to get my feet dirty. And, and but, but, you know, the thing of it is, is this, is that it's not unheard of for, you know, there to be a time where the Holy Spirit's moving upon your heart to seek him. And then you wait a little bit longer. And then the next thing you know, you're looking for him and you're not really feeling the presence of God like you used to. And I have to encourage you. You don't want to stop seeking. You don't want to stop searching. Amen. And, and, and keep on going after the Lord, even though sometimes you don't feel it as much and you long for that day when you can feel his presence real thick. We don't move just by emotions. We move by what the word of God says. And the word of God says that he draws near those who draw near him. Amen. And so uh, praise God for that. All right. Now I want you to see in verse eight. So she can't find him. The watchmen of the city aren't helping her for sure. And it says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick of love. In other words, she ain't saying I'm sick of his love. She's saying I'm love sick. I miss him. I need his presence. And if you find him, would you please tell him that I love him? And then and this is what she ends up. This is what they end up responding to her. What is your beloved more than any other beloved? <laughs> I mean, it's like, what you got going on? What do you, what you think so special about your man? That you over here, you so lovesick, and you want everybody in the city. I mean, I'm kind of filling in the lines for you, but basically that's what they're saying. I mean, what's the big deal with your beloved? Why don't you tell us a little bit about him? Oh, thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? I mean, you're wanting us to get up in the middle of the night to help you find your beloved? What's so special about him? Well, here she goes. Now, once again, I don't know that I don't want anybody ever using these adjectives for me. Maybe about the marble legs. It sounds real strong, you know, but other than that, I don't know. But this is what she said. She says, my beloved is white and ruddy, meaning he's got a white, he's got a relatively white complexion probably, and he's got reddish type hair more than likely. The chiefest among 10,000. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the barrel. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon. Excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. You want to know about him? Well, let me tell you about him. This is who he is. This is what he looks like. And this is what he means to me. Now, I don't know, once again, the imagery that she's trying to evoke for you and I is difficult for us to really wrap our mind around it, but it's obvious that she's very passionate and she is very much consumed with the love of her beloved and the way that she's describing him, you can only imagine that she's like intense. You know what I'm saying? You want to know about him? Well, let me tell you about him. And this is who he is. And this is what he is. And this is what he looks like. Okay, so what's interesting to me is how they respond to it. In the next verse, verse 1 of chapter 6. Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Whither is thy beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? In other words, after she's given all of this description of her beloved, their response is, where do you think he went? Where is he? We need to help you find him, right? And so, you know, one of the things that the Lord was showing, them about, showing me about this particular thing is that our love for the Lord. You know, here we are as the bride of Christ and whenever the Lord really does a work in our hearts and we really fall in love with him and we find ourselves, at least at least this has definitely happened to me to some extent, where when I start talking about Jesus, man, I'm telling you, I don't know, there's, I've got, still got some rough days, folks. I mean, I ain't got it all figured out, right? But I'll tell you this, is that all it takes is for one little crack of a door to open for a conversation about Jesus and I just forget everything else that's going on in the world and the next thing you 
know, I'm excited, I, and I'm telling people about the Lord, and, and sometimes they're like, man, where are you going to church? Or, man, how are we going to hold on that Jesus, you know? And, and so I'm just trying to say that when we want the Lord to do that work in our heart, amen, where we truly fall in love with Him. And once again, we all have different personalities, but when we begin to speak, and what, what is this Jesus that you talk about? What's so special about your Jesus? Let me tell you about my Jesus. This is what my Jesus did. You don't even want to know where I was, buddy. No, yeah, maybe you do. Let me just tell you a little bit about where I used to be and where the Lord brought me and what he's done in my Amen. life. And you know what? Sooner or later, you're going to hit on something that they dealing with too, you know? And, and you know, uh, well, anyway, we don't, I don't want to get into conversations I've had with other people. But the point is this, is that whenever the love of God is on the inside of us and we begin to speak about him as though whenever we do fall in love with him, it comes out in a whole different way. It's passion for Jesus is contagious. Love for the Lord is definitely contagious. I'm telling you right now. And, um, you know, we need to pray. We need to ask the Lord to fill us up with the Holy Ghost. Amen. That we'd be baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire. And that we would have the, the zeal of the Lord burning on the inside of us. A love for Jesus burning on the inside of us. Amen. That's really where I wanted to close right there. Uh, with with the idea that that the Lord desires to plant his love on the inside of us in such a way that it becomes contagious for those around us. Amen.